This is Haley Euler, the president for SET BP1 Society, which is our volunteer based nonprofit dedicated to SET BP1 disorder. Our mission is to provide support to individuals with SET BP1 disorder and their families, to promote discussion and fund research, and to bring awareness and education to the public. And then maybe change. Thank you. Uh, we believe our organization will bring targeted treatments to individuals impacted by SEP BP1 disorder by being proactive, unrelenting, and focusing on our mission. As an organization, our idea of targeted treatments include proven teaching methods, programs, and or therapies that help our children learn more effectively, medications that are customized for individuals with SEP BP1 disorder, and one day a treatment that permanently removes the barriers that SEP BP1 disorder creates for our children. And then Lindsay, if we can move, and then move one more slide. Thank you. During last year's virtual family conference, I presented this slide. We aim to fund one biological model for SEP BP1 disorder, either a mouse model or human IPSC, induced pluripotent stem cell model, and a journey, diagnostic journey guide through funds we raised in 2017 and from our successful Rare Carousel of Possible Dreams fundraiser. Here we are one year later, next slide piece, please, and we have played a role in advancing six research projects. For the mouse model research, we have engaged Dr. Kat Lutz at Jackson Laboratories with oversight by Dr. Chung in her role as the director of the treatment center at Columbia University to develop a mouse model representative of SEP BP1 disorder. Dr. Lutz is currently obtaining the SEP BP1 knockout mouse model in France to see if it'll be a good model to start with. For human IPSC research, Dr. Carl Ernst at McGill University has collected urine samples from two families with a child with SEP BP1 disorder and from two families with a child with Schenzel Gideon syndrome to learn more about the function of the SEP BP1 gene. Dr. Simon Fisher, our $25,000 SEP BP1 Society grant awardee is currently finalizing approvals to collect fibroblasts, which are skin samples, from families with a child with SEP BP1 disorder. He will use those fibroblasts to develop human IPSCs, IPSC cell lines, and human cellular models carrying the SEP BP1 mutations to further understand the disorder. We decided not to fund the diagnostic journey guide at this time as we feel data collected from the current research studies will help to develop the diagnostic journey guide in the future. We are proud to say, however, that we have a SET BP1 disorder guide that just released this week. It was developed by NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, in partnership with SET BP1 Society and approval from Dr. Bregev Mamban. Check out this new resource listed on our website and on NORD's website. Next slide, please. Two SEP BP1 disorder phenotype studies are kicking off and have been developed in development in 2018. So Dr. Angela Morgan will talk more about her study later in the conference. And Dr. Brege von Bonn from Red Bow Medical Center in the Netherlands is working in collaboration with Dr. Sid, our SEP BP1 neurologist at Boston Children, and Dr. Wendy Chung to produce the most comprehensive SEP BP1 disorder phenotype paper to date. The paper will include data collected by Dr. Von Bonn by Dr. Sid and from participants in the Simons VIP study. The data collection for this paper is already underway and expected to be completed in the upcoming months. All of this has come about from 2017 raised funds. Funds raised through the Rare Carousel of Possible Dreams fundraiser and outside funding at various institutions. Funds are dedicated to that BP1 community raised during our most recent Giving Tuesday fundraiser will help support our SET BP1 disorder mouse model development. Next slide, please. Our focus for this year is to continue to collaborate and work with the researchers we've previously mentioned to help support their research projects and to continue to focus on translational research, basically research designed to help individuals impacted by the disorder. To support the translational research, we have our biggest fundraiser coming up on June 8th, so mark those calendars, the Million Dollar Bike Ride, sponsored by the University of Pennsylvania's Orphan Disease Center. We will also have our annual Giving Tuesday online fundraiser at the end of November. We plan to continue to serve our community 
and are excited to help organize our first in-person family meetup in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on Sunday, June 9th, the day after the million dollar bike ride. We hope many of our families can join us. And next slide, please. Our focus also remains on spreading awareness of the disorder. And we were awarded a grant from Ovid Therapeutics to support this mission. We will develop information sheets in multiple languages for families and medical professionals. Reach out to genetic institutions to expand our SEPVP1 disorder testing and develop a marketing campaign, which will include a promotional video to help others visualize what it's like to live with SEPVP1 disorder and the impact on families. Next slide, please. Registration for the Million Dollar Bike Ride just opened this week. You can now set up your own fundraising pages and register for the event. Funds for set BP1 disorder research will be matched up to $30,000, and we have a goal to raise 40,000 40, before matching. Our goal this week is for five families to register to participate at the event, and we would love to have at least five fundraising pages set up this week as well. More info about the Million Dollar Bike Ride event and registration can be found on our events page at www.setbp1.org. Next slide. 2019 is the year for hope. Be the hope, be the change. We are set BP1 strong. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or share more information about Set BP1 Society's plans after the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Haley. And now we're gonna pass it off to Dr. Chung for our presentation. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, Haley, I just wanna compliment you and all the other families in Set PP1. You guys have organized so quickly and so efficiently. It's just a real pleasure to be affiliated with the group. Um, as Haley had introduced, I'm a medical geneticist and pediatrician and also um, the director of clinical research at the Simons Foundation and the leader for Simons VIP. Next slide. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is to be able to go over a little bit of the genetics as well as some of the medical issues, and I'll be glad to take questions at the end. Um, so all of you are on the recording today or on the WebEx today um, because there's a child in your family with SETBP1. Uh, I think all of you know this, but I'm just going to go very quickly through this. Um, this is a, one of the 20,000 genes that we have in terms of our genetic information. Next slide. And when you look at your family history, in, in most or all of your cases, um, this was something that actually started brand new with your child, your son or your daughter. That is that this was not something inherited from either one of the parents. It wasn't inherited from the grandparents. It didn't skip any generations. Um, this was something that started new. One question that some families ask me is, will this happen again? Um, so we as parents, or when we think about our other children that don't have set BP1, will this happen again? Um, and the answer for the most part is no. That is that for parents that have one child with set BP1, the chance is very, very, very low that they would have another child with set BP1, but there technically is a very small possibility, less than 1% chance, uh, but a small possibility that another egg cell or another sperm cell could carry the same set BP1 change. And so if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to answer it later. But the bottom line is that it, it very rarely happens twice in one family. For the other siblings, the other brothers and sisters of the child with set BP1, they will not have to worry about that happening to their children. For many of you, that's not for many, many years, but just don't lose any sleep over those issues. Next slide. So um, as we're, I'm sorry, I put this just in words. Um, so this will be archived. So anyone that wants to do, see any of this doesn't have to spend time writing any of it, this down. Um, I will say that if any families are really concerned about this, they can talk to a local genetic counselor or geneticist at their uh, local institution, hospital, university, and they'll be able to help them uh, with issues of any one specific pregnancy. Next slide, Lindsay. So I'm gonna to review today uh, mostly information that came from the Simons VIP registry, the SEPBP1 registry. Uh, if anyone's having any difficulty registering 
registering or being able to, you know, they get stuck on registration, uh, feel free to give us, send us an email afterwards and we'll help you get unstuck. Um, I know there may be some things that might not be crystal clear or, or some confusion. So part of what we want to be able to do is um, help the community bring this information together. So Simon VIP is an online registry, meaning that anyone in the world can enter this. Um, this is the website itself is in English, but if people would like to participate that speak other languages, let us know because we're in the process of translating this to other languages. So far, in terms of the SEP BP1 community, we have 21 families that are registered. And as I'll be explaining, um, I'm going to present the data today for the first 10 families that have given their information that I'm going to describe. Uh, what that tells me is that there are 11 families that are. Excellent. There are 11 families that are somewhere along that process of not being represented in today's information. Um, it's not because we're not interested, uh, but they just haven't finished the overall process. And that process involves us reviewing your laboratory genetic test report um, and signing a research consent to say that it's okay to use your information in a de-identified way. The reason that we review that direct genetic information, as you'll see, um, in the numbers going from 17 to 14, there were three families where it's not 100% certain yet that that set BP1 change is in fact uh, a condition causing or a neurological causing genetic variance. And as I'll be showing you in a second, it's we have to be um, confident enough that these are in fact real genetic changes to feed this information or give this information back to the families. We don't lose the information. Over time, we revise and update this information based on our confidence and our understanding of the uh, genetic variants in SETBP1. Uh, but at this point, we wanted to be really confident. And so there are three families um, that consented that aren't represented today. Uh, like I said, if anyone gets stuck with any of this, let me know. Um, but to collect the information, one of my genetic counselors at Columbia does what we call a medical history interview, as well as getting some information about uh, how your child has been developing, um, some easy questions that are easy to answer. Um, and hopefully it doesn't take more, it usually takes somewhere between about 60, 60 minutes to two hours, so one to two hours in terms of that. Next slide. So, this slide is showing you uh, of the 14 individuals that we had a chance to review their genetic test reports, what the different genetic changes are. And I know this looks like gobbledygook, uh, but let me walk you through a couple of them. Importantly, what you'll see on the right is that the number of, on the left is the number or is the exact um, address or, or spot where the genetic change occurs. And on the right, what you'll see is that for any one of those genetic change, changes, there is only one child. And so one of the points that I want to make today is it's really, really important. Haley was talking about some of the experiments that will be done with induced pluripotential stem cells. And one of the things that's really important is to make sure each one of your children are represented because they're each unique. Um, and so as we try and come up with generalities or summary statements describing everyone, uh, I will say that everyone, it, it is converging. We're starting to get a clearer picture about the things that are the same. But I will say that some of the things could be different uh, because the genetic differences are different. Uh, each one is, like I said, an individual person. Um, if you'll notice, and let me just describe to you how to read this. So on the left, when you see the protein change, um, the first, that three-letter GLN or TRP, those are an abbreviation for the amino acid um, that is usually in that position. The second spot, which is the number, so 89 or 274, that tells you the exact address in the protein where that change occurs. And what you'll see is everyone represented here represents a different location, a different amino acid position that's altered. When you see that star at the end, or if you see a star anywhere within those letters, or you see T-E-R, which stands for termination, or FS, which stands for frame shift. So any one of those first, let me see, two, four, six, eight, nine different changes, all of them cause what we call truncation of the protein. So it causes um, not the complete protein to be made, but a portion of the protein. And as far as we can tell, we think those first nine changes should act about the same. And so as I said, there is some convergence, there is some similarities for many of your children. 
However, when we start looking at the ones at the end of the list, the 854, 858, uh, 874, you'll see that there is what we call a single amino acid substitution. So as an example, for the very bottom row, that's a leucine at amino acid position 957 that's now altered by a proline. And so in that particular case, for that uh, set BP1 protein, there's only one single little amino acid that's different, um, but we think that actually is what's responsible for the changes. We're not sure what each of those single amino acid differences mean, and so one of the reasons why we're not 100% confident that each one of these is the cause for your child's neurodevelopmental disorder is because we don't know at a functional level how that CEPBP1 protein works. Over time, it definitely is going to happen, but again, for any of you that have any of those last five changes in particular, it's really, really important to be involved and represent your child in the research to better understand whether they're different, your child is different in some way, or whether um, your child is acting like the, the ones at the top of that list so that we can try and answer some of the questions families had about prognosis and what the future holds. Um, there's there's some relatively recent publications, um, and I'm showing this for anyone that wants to. I put the reference so you can actually go straight to the primary publication. Um, there's a condition called Chintzel-Gideon syndrome, which some of you know is associated with changes in CEPBP1. Um, but there are some differences between Chintzel-Gideon syndrome and particularly what I was seeing in your children as you were um, putting up the beautiful pictures of your kiddos, as well as uh, hearing what some of the challenges were. Next slide, Lindsay. Um, so one of the reasons and, and one of the things I want to draw your attention to is on the right, um, again, this particular publication was focusing on Chintzel-Gideon syndrome, and you'll see that the particular amino acids that are affected in that case are very, very specific. It's 868, 869, 870, 871, but they're clustered in a very, very particular region. And it may be that those changes are different and they act differently. There's a different biology, perhaps, with those changes than what we see with the ones on the left, which are the ones, the families that are in Simon's VIP. So one of the, in my opinion, one of the things that's important for us to do going forward as a community is to try and understand what's the same and what's different. One of the thinking, one of the hypotheses, one of the ideas is that all mutations, all changes in the gene may not be the same. There may be some that act in what we call a gain of function, or so they're sort of in overdrive. There may be some that act as loss of function. They may not be showing up to do their job. And there may be some that are in the middle, that are not completely in overdrive, and they're not completely asleep at the wheel. So with that, um, some of the studies that Haley was talking about in terms of the induced player potential stem cells, um, if your child is ever asked to give a blood sample to do what we call functional studies or look at the biology, it's in part to try and understand these things. Next slide. Um, and, and let me just also, um, actually, I'm sorry, Lindsay, if you can go back for one second. I also want to draw your attention. I don't want anyone to freak out by this, but I do want to draw your attention. In this publication, one of the important points that the, the group was making um, that I've shown below the stick figure is hematological malignancies. And one of the things people are wondering about is that there are some individuals who are not born with these mutations like your children were, but they acquire them over time and they may be associated with an increased cancer risk. And so um, one of the long-term things I'm quite keen for the community to learn as quickly as we can is whether there is any increased cancer risk and what it might be. My guess is that it's not for everyone, but there may be certain particular genetic changes that are. And so again, this is motivating a lot of the future research that we need to do as a community. Next slide, Lindsay. So as we go through this, I'm gonna shift gears now, um, and this is now reporting the details of the 10 families that got through doing the medical history interview with us. They range in age from age three to 14. 
importantly, and what I want to draw your attention to is it's only 14. So I do, it's not that there aren't individuals over the age of 14 out there with SETVP1, um, but as many of you know, it wasn't necessarily easy to get your genetic diagnosis. And for many of our adults, I think they've forgotten about the idea of even get, getting a genetic diagnosis. And so they're out there, they're not diagnosed, they don't realize they have SETVP1, uh, but we're missing the opportunity to learn from them. So we've got, I won't talk about it today, but we've got some other initiatives out there to try and identify those folks too to help the community. Next slide. So in summary, um, the take-home message really is that uh, the children that, were, that are in the Simons VIP so far are largely very, very healthy children. So um, I want to put your mind at ease. Um, there haven't been so many medical issues. Really, it's been focused on, as people were saying in the introduction, issues in terms of speech and development and uh, gross motor development and being able to communicate and focus. That's really where we've seen the issues. So um, for this, of the seven individuals who answered all of these particular questions, um, it was consistent that an individuals had, if they were younger, we call it developmental delay. If they were older, we call it intellectual disability. Um, in particular, had issues in terms of speech and communication, although assisted communication devices have been extremely helpful. Um, it wasn't very frequent to see autism, um, but some people had some of the behaviors that might overlap with autism and issues with attention or being distracted or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD um, was, was pretty common. Next slide. Um, when we think about when certain things happen, and some of you have older children, some of you have younger children, uh, we just wanted to give you some idea of when things like first words started coming in. So for the children who have at, had at least one or more words, uh, it came in a variety of ages, um, but don't give up, keep working at this. Um, some individuals were uttering words or word approximations by the second year of age. This is on the left. Um, children also were a little bit later, some coming in at three, but even one child's coming in a little after five. Um, by contrast, on the right, looking at first steps, uh, children were walking, some of them delayed, but they were achieving the ability to walk in many cases. And again, it takes practice. So some were two or three or four when that happened. Next slide. Um, one of the other things that impacts, you know, daily life is toilet training or being able to have either control for bladder or for bowel. And on the left is bladder control. On the right is bowel control. Um, and as you can see, sometimes it wasn't always 100% consistent, but children were getting toilet trained. Oftentimes, again, three, uh, four or five, sometimes even seven or eight uh, when this was happening. But for many children, um, again, with a consistent behavioral uh, modification and behavioral training could achieve one or sometimes both bowel and bladder control. Next slide. Um, going to the back, uh, back to the beginning in terms of when children were itty bitty uh, just after birth, just reflecting back, um, the neonatal time was sometimes you know, a little bit rockier, not terrible, um, but some of the children had jaundice, they were a little yellow, they may have had some problems breathing um, that resolved relatively quickly, um, but I would say these were minor things um, and most of the children did relatively well in the newborn period. Next slide. And these weren't long-term complications. However, um, many of the mothers were the ones who responded or, or talked with our genetic counselors over the phone. Many of the mothers appreciated very early on, especially if they'd had other children, that something was different. Um, and they were noticing things like they weren't latching on, they weren't uh, sucking and swallowing quite as effectively. Maybe their tone was a little bit lower. Um, but many people appreciated very early that something was different. Next slide. Um, one of the issues that's come up, and, and I think almost, if not everyone, almost everyone has at least checked for this, uh, are vision issues. So it hasn't been, 
you know, terrible vision issues. It hasn't been blindness or anything like that. But we have seen some issues with children needing glasses and maybe needing uh, having crossed eyes or strabismus. And I do want to highlight this simply because if it's difficult to see and focus, it makes it harder to learn, to take in the world around you accurately and to navigate the world. Um, so if your child hasn't been evaluated for any vision issues, seeing a, a pediatric ophthalmologist can be helpful. Next slide. Um, there are things that many of the neurologists, the child neurologists, notice when they do an examination. Again, um, thankfully, seizures have not been very frequent. Uh, we did have one child with seizures. Um, but more consistent are issues like low muscle tone or coordination problems or being clumsy um, or having taking longer in terms of fine motor skills. Uh, so those are the types of things that we saw more frequently. Um, but again, these are things that many of you are working with great behavioral uh, uh, or many therapists, either um, physical therapists or occupational therapists. And for many of you, this has gotten better over time. Next slide. Um, some of the families did report to us some issues, some, some gastrointestinal issues. These were not infrequent. Um, they're not certainly uh, life-threatening problems, but they can you know, have an impact in terms of how your child feels for sure. Some of the most common ones were having what we call reflux or heartburn uh, or constipation or diarrhea or even alternating between the two. And this can definitely be uncomfortable or, or make your child feel off. Um, there are thankfully either dietary changes or medications that can be helpful with this. And so many of the children already have been treated in that way. Next slide. Um, Infections have not been overwhelming. I don't think the children have any immunodeficiencies, uh, but we have seen a fair number of ear infections, and I think appropriately for families where the ear infections were repeated, um, where they were more frequent, several of the children have had ear tubes to make sure that they could hear very clearly, which obviously is important as they're developing speech and trying to uh, hear things clearly, hear words clearly. Next slide. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple issues on the next few slides. Um, I would say these were no more frequent in children with set BP1 than in the general population, but we did see one child with asthma. Next slide. Uh, in terms of other things, um, this probably is more set BP1 specific, but we have seen relatively minor either kidney or what we call genitourinary issues. Um, one child with hydronephrosis or fluid on the kidney, uh, three of the boys with undescended testicles. And if those continue to not descend on their own or not come into the scrotum, it is important to have a simple surgery to tack those down. Um, and one child where the opening at the end of the penis was slightly changed in terms of position. Um, we did have one child that had a, a particular heart valve, which had a little bit of, uh, was a little floppy and had a little bit of flow backwards, uh, but not, not serious. Next slide. Um, we also had a couple children who were on the shorter side or had some difficulty gaining weight. So that, that is something we're paying attention to. Next slide. And we did have and we did have a couple of children that had, again, not anything serious, but some usual skin manifestations like rashes. Okay, um, we're getting towards the end here. So we did have some minor surgeries that were for the issues I talked about, ear tubes, orchiopexy, or tacking down the testicles. Um, one child who had a cleft lip repaired, uh, but thankfully, as I said, most of these were very simple, straightforward minor surgeries. Next slide. Um, we did have one child with scoliosis, and for those of you who have younger children, remember that our oldest children are still just young teenagers, and scoliosis is more common with children with hypotonia during the teenage years. So I do want you to check and have your pediatrician check what each um, regular child's care visit for scoliosis. Very simple to just look at the back and make sure everything looks straight. Next slide. Um, with this, some of the families were wondering about particular medications. I will say, I know some of the families had asked about things like cannabinoids or 